The problems facing New Zealand's primary sector have been mounting at a rapid pace. So I think it's time for open hearts and open minds. Welcome to another show of Sarah's Country as we continue to build on the momentum that we've started uh, and how amazing it's been uh, in our absolute first week. As more and more people are discovering this cool new live show with me, your host Sarah Perry, uh, Monday through Thursday from 7 o'clock. We want you to, if you're enjoying it, tell your friends, tell your networks and spread the love uh, because of course built on the same values of Farmers Weekly, that it's about bringing you the matters that matter most. And of course, uh, it has always been in a newspaper form, but Farmers Weekly is now being broadcast live daily through my show, Serious Country, across 10 plus social media platforms and on farmersweekly.co.nz forward slash Sarah's Country. Note, if you do have trouble streaming this, we appreciate it is at a heavy peak time during the night. It is available on demand on video on Farmers Weekly's YouTube channel, as well as, of course, as of Monday, I will have all the interviews and full shows on my podcast, Sarah's Country. So make sure you subscribe to both those channels. It is all great talking about this new normal with all this new technology and farmers telling me they Bluetooth my show to their hearing aids from their Apple Watch. But I really think some of those things from the good old days we should bring back. So I was, I go for my walk and I pick up the paper out of the letterbox and this is their local rag, the local uh, Canterbury rag. And in there, I'll see if I can find it, is an ad I haven't seen for many, many years. Country Companionship. So, like, I just really want you to bear a thought for the people right now on Tinder and Bumble because you can't, no one's moving in and out of this 100k radius, you see, and so their limits uh, going into winter are quite thin. So I think we should bring back the whole, you know, country contacts, classifieds listing in the paper. What do you think? Uh, Dean will kill me for this. This one here, it says, I'll just see if I can read it. Five foot eleven, leggy blonde, qualified two dogs in the South Island. Uh, Dad's got a hunting lodge and pays for her own horse gear. Perfect woman, really, isn't it? Right, I want you to tag in the comments below your single mates and have an attempt at writing their profile like this one here in the uh, country companionship section of the local Canterbury rag. Now, I've got a bit of a song for our poll tonight. Hit it, Joel. Telling fairy tales. How great. Poll tonight's dedicated to Mr. Jones. It's Mr. Shane Jones, who told me this week uh, that he was just joking when he called farmers rednecks. You know, just take a joke. Okay, Mr. Jones, so following your announcement of the government's handout uh, to tap into major shovel ready infrastructure projects to keep the economy afloat, an unemployment set uh, to hit kind of close to 15%. What about making water storage top of the list? Mr Jones, have you heard of Ruatanifa? Right, the poll tonight, do you think water storage should be at the top of the government's infrastructure list? Yes or no, that's our poll on Serious Country page on Farmers Weekly and also the Farmers Weekly Facebook page. We put the poll out a couple of hours before the show. At the moment, 84% of people think that water storage should be at the top of the list. But there's some in the comments that say, no, roading. Roading should be at the top. And uh, But then, of course, there is a lot of support saying, let's keep things real. New Zealand is going to need money from selling what we do best. I want to know your thoughts on whether we should have water storage infrastructure at the top of the government spending list. Mr Jones now a major fan of getting in behind farming. All right, let's get on to what's coming up in the show tonight. After 7.20, we have uh, the legend himself, Tangaro Walker from Farm for Life, joining us after his appearance this morning with uh, me old mate Duncan Garner on the AM show uh, to explain how business is not as usual uh, for the farming sector. And he shares his tips of keeping the momentum going with your team at this time, as well as uh, keeping your well-being at the forefront. 
of your business. The government has shelled out money to farm advisors this week to provide free assistance to farmers to budget feed going into the winter in also such an uncertain time. So after 7.30, I have Simon Glenny from Ag... Oh, sorry, Abacus Bio is a sheep and beef consultant to talk through that scheme. And then to end the show at 7.40, we have the wonderful knowledge of uh, Agribusiness Banking, NZAB's Managing Director, Scott Wishart, to take all your questions on how to navigate uh, the finance world and cash flow planning with all of these worries ahead. If you're new to the show and this is your first time look at listening or watching Serious Country, it's all about participation and interaction with you, our audience. So if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, check out the comments below. I can get them all here on my wee whiz-bang laptop. Uh, or go to Serious Country on Farmers Weekly and you can ask questions and participate in the in the poll. And anonymous if you want to keep your questions on the D-low. So Father Bob... My father, Bob, is heading into harvesting the vineyard this week without his daughters to help footpress the Riesling. So I decided it'd be a good time to reach out to the New Zealand wine growers to join us uh, next on how the industry is gearing up for a harvest with limited workers and limited movement, of course, and, if, and the supply chain interruption that is happening for our golden juice. So as we are going to get Philip Gregan, CEO of New Zealand Wine Growers, on the line, here is a short video from the New Zealand wine story that we should all be so proud of. This is Sarah's Country. Welcome to a land of open spaces. Where the pure elements are embodied in every drop of wine. Where each vine is embraced by the forces of nature and enriched by the sea. New Zealand wine tastes like it does because it's about our place. This young, dramatic landscape, youthful soils, a maritime influence where every vine is touched by the ocean. And on top of that, we're an island nation miles away from anywhere else. In the world of wine, there's nothing like it. It's entirely unique where distinct landscapes yield some of the world's most invigorating new wines. And the land is treated with care and respect, now and for generations to come. We're not denuding nature, we actually feel like we're adding something back and making sure that this is something for the future. The long-term benefits of treating the land better is that the land treats you better. Welcome to a country of open hearts, where doing the right thing comes naturally and unique character always shines through. It's about pono. Pono is about integrity. It's about doing what you say you're going to and being trustworthy, open and honest. Where collaboration and community allow knowledge to thrive and family wines grow stronger with each generation. We're now known as one of the best wine producing regions in the world and we now have something that we're going to be handing on to another generation who are going to expand on that and take it into the future and that's extremely important to us. Welcome to a country of open minds where tradition and innovation are blended to perfection and simplicity builds complexity. When we started out with wine in New Zealand, we didn't have hundreds of years of history like they do in France, so we needed to be uh, innovative. We needed to experiment with varietals, we needed to experiment with different sites. Probably the most classic example is Sauvignon Blanc in Marlborough. The innovation there was to bring that grape, to grow it in the stony, bony soils. And in doing that, we discovered that the grape expresses itself completely different. It has the essence of New Zealand in it. When you taste a glass of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, you know exactly where it comes from. To me, that defines a great wine region in the world. We're treading lightly and not interfering allows what's good to be at its very best. And a pioneering spirit delivers inspiring results. Well, in 1961, when I first started making wine in New Zealand, if you wanted to be a winemaker, you had to have a real passion for it. You had to be innovative and think for yourself. That created a great foundation for us. It's amazing, in virtually one generation, we've gone from nothing into a world-class wine industry. Welcome to New Zealand, where our wine embodies the very essence of our land and people. Yeah, we're going to make great wine here, full stop.
Zealand uh, wine industry that has harvest going on around the country right at the moment. So you would uh, thank your lucky stars that the New Zealand government recognise the fact that the grape and wine industry are, of course, essential businesses to operate and continue to keep their supply chains open. Uh, salad doors and restaurants unfortunately have closed but online wine deliveries is booming. Uh, I'm joined now by Philip Gregan, CEO of New Zealand Wine Growers. Uh, Philip, what is the sort of general feeling amongst your uh, wine industry members at the moment in the uncertain times? I think there's a a huge sense of relief uh, that we have been able to get the grapes in Uh, But there's also awareness that there's a a huge responsibility that's coming with that and uh, a large degree of empathy for those parts of the economy that aren't, aren't able to operate at the moment. So there's some mixed feelings there. So how have you implemented advice to the the harvest and around the uh, obviously restriction of movement of workers, um, but also to and how they can harvest, um, you know, alongside each other in the vines at the moment. Well, we've been working very very closely with uh, MPI. Um, we've uh, been in contact with them virtually daily. Um, we've been issuing guidance to the industry about how they manage um, distance and social separation. Uh, and we've had literally hundreds of queries come in from our members around the country. And uh, we're, we're triaging those and the really difficult ones, we go back to MPI and seek their guidance and then we get that information out to the industry. How is the labour force, is, are you needing more workers to come in? No, at the moment we're, we're quite comfortable with the, the labour force available for us to harvest. Um, a lot of the grapes are actually machine harvested, so we're very lucky uh, in that way. Uh, but there are some areas which rely heavily on hand, uh, hand harvesting, so Central Otago, uh, for example, uh, lots of hand harvesting in the wire wrapper. Have you um, had, had Riesling between your toes, Philip? <laughs> not this year, no. Um, plenty of Riesling in North Canterbury, of course, and Whitebra. Oh, it is the weirdest, weirdest feeling. I tell you that yeah, everybody's got to got to do that once. Um, and and so, what about with regards to going international markets? Um, being a, a New Zealand's such a rock star, um, are you concerned about the impacts flowing back? Look, the, the impacts we've seen so far in terms of um, sales through supermarkets have been very, very positive, very strong. But clearly the there's a lot of damage being done to the hospitality sector, uh, restaurant sector, uh, and you know that's going to lead to difficulty with distributors paying their bills, with importers pa- paying their bills. So there's a lot of concern how this is going to play out over the next three or four months, and uh, we can see a lot of hard times coming ahead. So what sort of uh, financial planning can your members be doing to be able to get through this this time or is it is it very still um, unclear on on how they can shift a lot of this product? We've just carried out a survey of our members uh, and uh, it's clear from that that they're anticipating pretty hard times, a large number of them. Um, a number of them have already um, applied for the, the government's wage subsidy. Uh, that's going to be clearly very important. And we're looking at other things that we might be able to do to make some suggestions to the government as to how they can help our members uh, through the next three months and you know get going again at some stage. Wine being a product that obviously doesn't date straight away, is like, like for instance wool, but obviously not as long as wool, um, ha- the shelf life of, of wine, does that help ease the burden over, say, for instance, livestock? Yes, I think it does. Uh, it, you know, the wine doesn't have to be sold tomorrow. Uh, it can be sold over a, a period of time. But the challenge, of course, is there'll be another vintage next year, and so um, we need to uh, we need to move the the product in a reasonable time frame. Otherwise, that uh, gives rise to capacity issues in vintage 2021. So mm. it's only 12 months away. Mm, and it's okay if you've got those ageing wines, but those young wines like uh, Sauvignon Blanc, it's, which is, of course, underpins a lot of New Zealand's wine industry, doesn't it? Um, where yes, the it big does, crunch comes? 
Yes, those wines um, generally are sold within a, a year of vintage. There are the exceptions. But then you've got wines such as Pinot Noir, Cabernet Merlot and Syrah, which can be sold over a longer period of time. So the challenge is not quite as much with them. What is... Um what was the trajectory looking like pre-COVID, sort of the end of 2019, you know, when we thought 2020 was going to be the the, the major year that we were all looking for? Wine was on I a think, good trajectory, wasn't it, internationally? Yes, look, we um, consumers around the world love our wines uh, and uh, that's been the story of the last 10 or 20 years and we saw 2020 being no different. And underlying everything that's happened is consumers still want our wines. The difficulty is uh, having the channels open so that they can purchase them. And whether that's the cellar door in New Zealand or a restaurant in Queenstown or a, a restaurant in New York or London, it's having those channels open, which is the, the thing that the industry is going to be missing. How is e-commerce set up internationally? I know that we're set up very well here domestically to be able to buy and order wine online. Um, but your international distributors to be able to um, put New Zealand wines forward for the, the stay-at-home e-commerce market, which could become a, a huge part of um, our future. Yeah, the, the online sales are absolutely booming at the moment. There are one or two countries with very strange rules, um, such as the United States, States, because we have alcohol in our products, so that slightly complicates things. But yes, there's, there's a big opportunity online and uh, our wineries are really working very hard to take advantage of that at the moment. So harvest is obviously underway, um, and generally, on some on positive note, you're quite happy with how um, the flavour profiles and, of course, the yields are looking? Look, if it wasn't for the virus, everybody would be saying this is one of the best vintages we've ever had. Uh, but at the moment, it's the virus that's dominating the conversation, and rightly so. Hopefully in six months' time, people are going to say, well, that was pretty amazing. We had a, we had a great harvest. And uh, the way things are shaping up, our winemakers are, are very confident, but you know, only time will tell. Thank you so much, CEO of New Zealand Wine Growers, Philip Gregan, joining us uh, there on Serious Country to talk about uh, the situation that's happening to um, one of our golden ch children of our export markets, our wine industry. They've done an incredible job uh, in being able to show the rest of us how to add value over volume uh, and, and where they're sitting in the international stage. Now, I've got a few people that are obviously jumping on to see our next guest, um, Mr. Tangaroa Walker. Uh, so I it was said earlier, if you weren't watching earlier in the show, I discovered in the local paper around um, the country companionship ads, you know, like the country contacts classifieds that they used to have. Um, there's some struggling, isolated, single uh, rural people out there who have um, run out of selections on their, the, their bumble. So um, I want you to tag your single mates below and write a bit of a profile for them. This will stir up a bit of stuff. So I thought I'd write one. I know he's, he's not single, um, but if I was to write his profile for the this this country companionship in the in the paper because we're going back to the old days now. He uh, d describe him as a an exotic six foot passionate milkmaid that loves to make people laugh across the world. Pumps a hundred kilo of iron iron in the morning and delivers babies at night. You'll have to stick around to check out who our next guest is on Sarah's Country. This is Sarah's Country. Welcome to a land of open spaces where the pure elements are embodied in every drop of wine where each vine is embraced by the forces of nature and enriched by the sea New Zealand wine tastes like it does because it's about our place this young, dramatic landscape, youthful soils a maritime influence where every vine is touched by the ocean and on top of that we're an island nation miles away from anywhere else. In the world of wine there's nothing like it, it's entirely unique. Where distinct landscapes yield some of the world's most invigorating new wines and the land is treated with care and respect. This is Sarah's Country.
Aotearoa New Zealand has always been a land that has provided for its people, a land of abundance and opportunity. Our dedicated team at Ag Research know that embracing kaitiakitanga will see this continue for future generations. The work we do is transforming the way we farm and revolutionizing the way New Zealanders care for our animals and for our land. We work hard to create the world's most desirable food and bio-based products through smart, sustainable farming, led by some of the world's most phenomenal research and informed by the consumers who benefit from this passion. Through a focus on environmental sustainability and climate change initiatives, this passion will allow our work to continue for generations to come. Our proficiencies in research run wide, from seeds to pest control, high-value food production to practical farming systems and quality assurance. From the smallest rural land use project to international research programs, our science and technology innovations drive the prosperity of our precious agricultural sector. It's through this research that New Zealand retains its position as a scientifically advanced global agricultural leader. Our commitment to the growth of our wider New Zealand economy, its people, and the kaitiakitanga of Aotearoa is at the very heart of every scientific innovation and creation we deliver. Ag Research. Firmly grounded in this land. These waters. Looking to what's in the stars and the future. Atamatai. Matai Fetu. The rhetoric has definitely changed. It feels like a jolt to me. I'm not sure about you listening or watching, um, but farming got cool again. But doesn't it piss you off when the commentary is, oh, but it's business as usual for the farming sector? Well, it's not really. Uh, Tangara Walker from Farm for Life was on the AM show this morning talking to Duncan Garner about that and joins us now on Sarah's Country. Kia ora, mate. Kia ora, Sarah. You just uh, interrupt me there. I was about to jump on the shower, mate. Oh, I can't actually see you, so I'm hoping you're wearing something. Yeah, oh, I'm definitely wearing something. I'm oh, just about to got my shower cap on and uh, oh, you wherever yes. you go. Oh, you're such a hoot. They're so good to have you on the first actual first week of Sarah's Country. We talked about this when we were doing a bit of a speaking um, tour, me and you, and um, lots has happened since then, of course. Yep, heaps of ha- heaps has happened. I've um, I've I've got now got a plus one, so I've got my little son to going her, and uh, he'll be starting to crack into the old social media game. It's awesome. Oh, he'll be getting to such a fun stage now. Yeah, definitely. He's I'm starting to giggle, and he's probably the only person that laughs at my jokes. <laughs> I'm sure there's actually about ninety thousand people that follow you on Facebook that actually laugh at your jokes too, Tangaroa. Um, you're just being modest now. Hey. Um, so, so tell me, how's firstly, how's things looking in Southland on the farm? Everything's looking beautiful on farm. It's um, quite sad to say to speak like this because obviously aware of what's happening um, further north or far right up the far north um, with the drought and all the rest of it. So, but I mean, mate, it's like it's beautiful spring weather here at the moment. Like even the gorse is starting to flower again. Oh goodness, you don't want that. Yeah, I reckon. <laughs> There's none of that on my farm though. No. <laughs> Goodness, no. No, gorse is a good nitrogen, um, you know, uh, what do you call it? Fixer. Fixer, that's the word. <laughs> hey, so Tangaroa, tell us, you're talking this morning to Duncan and um, and you just wanted to get the, the point out there that business not is not as usual. You know, you're constantly bombarded by, uh, you know, every man and his dog trying to sell you everything, every, you know, coming up your driveway and it's sort of, you can hear the birds now, it's that quiet but it also is yeah. coming at a really, you know, the interruption that you can't get things fixed. I mean, we heard yesterday from uh, Dana Cunningham in Southland, um, you know, and he's got things breaking down on his milk plant, can't get things fixed. Oh, it's because he's rough on gear, though. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, it's a, it, it is a bit of a struggle. Um, it's quite an eerie feeling not having anyone drive up the farm as, as annoying as they are when they are driving up. Um Right now, it's yeah, it is it is pretty lonely out, out here on farm, and I'm only 20 minutes from town. So, for those guys that are living way out in the middle of nowhere, um, you know, they probably look forward to the the local sales rep coming up the farm so we can uh, talk talk a bit of snack with them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, 
what about the sort of ty- type of commentary and feedback in the pulse that you're getting at the moment from people on your page, Farm for Life, uh, about how yeah. people are feeling? Are they sort of, I mean, one thing I really want to ask you actually, though, is around the attitude of, ha, 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 you knew that you needed us We're as farmers, blah, 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 blah. And you said this morning to Duncan, you know, come on, guys, we're all in this together. We always have been. And we may have got a bit disconnected, but this is how we're going to come back together. Absolutely. It's, um, it's, I'm actually really looking forward to it. It's going to be going to be awesome to work alongside our urban urban society again or urban communities. And um, it's only, you know, it's only since 2020, uh, sorry, the 2000s that we sort of created this disconnect with social media and relied on the media to sort of sh- show what farming's all about. And when we rely on that and don't actually have that link back to the farm again, things can be skewed. Um, so, it's going to be cool to tell the cool stories again and, you know, everyone's relying on social media so much at this present time um, that, you know, that we can tell good stories about what's happening on farm and cool to see Gary and Zed sort of jumping into that sort of social media platform as well. Yeah, absolutely. We've got a really cool video coming up um, later on from Gary and Zed that came out today that actually brought in a tear to my eye. They did a very, very yeah. good job of that, eh? Yeah, they did. Yeah. It's cool to get all our team on there. So we've got um, myself, Goody, and Detroit on there this morning. Nice, nice, nice. What have you, I mean, like we talk about bridging the, the rural urban and bringing people together and you, you, you're dealing with that interaction all the time on your videos. But when we were, um, you know, cruising around the country together, what I liked was a lot of the stories of the international people, like families in Mexico with young kids following you. And it's, yeah. it, it just blows your mind. Yeah, it is. Eh? It's a pretty pretty amazing how far-reaching one single post can go, um, depending on what you're talking about, obviously. But it's 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 really cool to, that people can be on, you know, subway trains from London, going through London, and they're sort of watching a live video of me carving a cow. And, <laughs> you know, then they look over their shoulder and there's people watching, you know, that they've never met before and all of a sudden create a bit of a connection there. It's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like, oh, goodness, what's that? Yes, yes. <laughs> Um, but no, no, you, what you've been doing um, is, is absolutely huge and you've got um, we, we obviously aspirations to continue to grow what you're doing and teaching people online and we'll look forward to catching up with you later on in the year as you're unfolding in the education space. Um, yeah. But what, what some of those, if we're just swinging back now to on farm, behind the farm gate right now, um, you have uh, been celebrated for the way that you have got an gr- amazing team culture and and celebrate um, how we can have a, a, a team culture on farm that's around well-being as the, at the forefront. What would be some of your advice to people watching now that they could do to sort of increase staff morale and look after each other um, even better than they may be doing right now? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's quite easy to get so embedded in what you're doing on farm. You know, often when you don't get off farm and, and step back and actually see what the big picture is in life in general, um, it's easy to get caught up on those small little things that are quite niggly with staff. And, um, you know, that, those small little things for us farmers that we quite, we're actually control freaks, a lot of us. We like things done our way um, and only our way. And um, and if you don't do it that way, they, you know, it's, it's a little chip on the shoulder and that's adding to the other 10 that have been, brought up this week you know so um, stepping off farm and realizing that you know there's there's people dying out there of starvation there's you know homeless people around the streets and you sort of come back to your farm and you're like oh the you know the my two i see missed that little spot on the lawn frick is it really that important so it's just about celebrating how good they are actually doing opposed to picking out all the little niggly things that we can be quite particular with as bosses mm. hey just to close tangaroa we have a um section on the Farmers Weekly website under the, on the Serious Country page. We're going to talk to Simon Glennie uh, next from Abacus Bio around the feed situation and feed budgeting, the government putting money into farm consultants to help you with feed budgeting. Dairy farmers are in incredible pasture management, um, at, at pasture management, sorry. What would be, you've, you've, got, you've been giving advice uh, and all sorts of things on Farm for Life, but what, what yep. are some of those really key fundamental tools that you give out on your page um, just to get right, and then everything else couldn't can flow on from there. Look, I personally think that being prepared, just like anything else, you know, you can't cook a feed unless you've got the groceries that you've uh, you know thought about and gone and brought. Um, last thing you want to do is get to the get to your cupboard and look at there and be like, oh shit, 
you know, what can we what can we cook for dinner tonight? Um, so being really organised with our feed budgets, but as well as that, getting in the experts. I mean, gone are the days where you had to know have to know everything on farm. You don't have to be an old or know everything. We've got professionals in all different areas, um, and those people are waiting at the end of their phones for uh, conversations to spark from us. We just need to. We need to be need to be proactive with that and, and get out there and, and make those phone calls. So, uh, but in saying that, as pasture managers, we have to have actually have the grass growing for us to manage it. So, unfortunately, for those that are further north, um, we, you know, they just haven't had the, the water to uh, make that pasture available for them to manage, and it's been quite difficult with the COVID nineteen stepping into into the space now because we've gone through this drought, and you've got partners that have uh, relied on on um, you know. Them, them going off farm and working in out in, in town or New World pushing trolleys because they've had to make up for the the, the lack of income coming in coming in on farm and then this COVID 19s hit as well so now they've lost their jobs in town and and are really struggling so and now they can't find you know they can't go out for job interviews because you're not allowed to leave the house mm. so um it's very sad and it's a very tough time at the moment and and you know a, a drought coupled with COVID 19s I mean, it's going to be bloody challenging. Mm. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us, Tangaroa. We'll get you on in future shows for, for sure, absolutely, because we want to continue to follow um, the awesome work that you've got in the pipeline. Tangaroa Walker from Farm for Life uh, joining us there on Serious Country. Time to jump over to our poll results. Uh, the poll tonight is uh, the government are going to invest heavily in infrastructure to keep the economy afloat. Should water storage be at the top of the list? Online, we're at 89% that say yes. And over on the Farmers Weekly Facebook page, 84% of you say yes. So we're very passionate about uh, throwing money into well-needed water storage projects. Hopefully the government are listening this time. So uh, coming up after the break, we're going to be joined by Simon Glennie, sheep and beef consultant from Abacus Bio, uh, who is going to be giving some tips on how to get through this feed pinch and how you can access free farm consultants, courtesy of new funding from MPI. This is Sarah's Country. Dear New Zealand. We know things are really tough out there right now. People are concerned about their health and the health of their loved ones. People are worried about the economy and when will things get back to normal. Believe me when I say, us farmers are feeling it too, but now's no time to panic. Our country can get through this together. We just need to follow instructions and stay home. Inside our bubble. Let's flatten this curve and stop this disease spreading. You don't need to worry about supermarkets getting low on food. There's plenty to go around for. Everyone. All the countries that could run out of food, New Zealand is not one of them. Our farmers are world leading. And we're damn good at what we do, producing high quality food. We have strong supply lines. And we're all working hard to keep food on the table. For your family and for ours. New Zealand dairy farmers produce enough for 100 million people. You're in good hands, New Zealand. You can count on us to keep calm and carry on farming. We're trusting you to stay at home to keep our country safe. We, we are, are following, following the rules too. too. We can't do this. We're all in this together. Cheers, New Zealand. Delicious. Ever wondered where it starts? Does it start with care? Respect. Fresh grass, 365 days a year. The truth is, delicious doesn't start in a single moment or with a single ingredient. Delicious starts here. One of the first things you learn when you live out here is where to shop for the things you need to live out here. Like electric fencing. Or horse thief. Or bee suits. Children. Chuck food. Do you want a couple of these? Or something stylish to wear. Not everyone's got stuff like this. But at Farmlands we do, and then some. So if you need anything to help your farm, 
Grow, milk, dredge. Rhea, come on in. Because we're out here too. Well, drought-induced feed shortages have forced a Woodville dairy farmer to dry off his herd two months earlier than usual. It's a decision that the Woodville dairy farmer, uh, Nick Beatham, has called the toughest financial decision he's ever had to make. Uh, to read the story, go to farmersweekly.co.nz. Well, the government this week has announced that free they're provide, putting money sorry, into uh, providing free farm consultancy uh, around feed budgeting advice. And so we thought we would uh, cross tonight to Simon Glennie from Abacus Bio. Good evening, Simon. Hi, Sarah. Firstly, can you just tell us, how are the feed budget situations varying in different regions around the country at the moment? Well, look, from uh, uh, what, I, what I hear, and obviously it's uh, very difficult when you're sitting at home, so we just have to we just have to listen and, uh, and and go with what we hear. Uh, up, up north, some recovery after the rain, but obviously uh, there's a lot of recovery needed in terms of condition on animals as well, and, and feed levels are just behind where they need to be. Uh, and in contrast, Southland and Otago uh, typically have pretty good feed levels, uh, but the concern there is that the land kill has been quite slow uh, and will continue to be so. So there's some pressure coming on and then that we see in the next six or eight weeks around that. Mm. What is some of the advice around mating that you might be giving to clients? Is just thinking about, um, you know, maybe pulling back mating hoggets or two-year-old heifers and things like that? Yeah, certainly. So? Uh, I mean, you, you've really got to look at and know what your feed situation is. I guess that's the first thing. Uh, but those are some of the tools then that, well, some of the options that are on the table uh, and like um, and not mating hoggets uh, is going to save some feed, but it also has an impact on, on the finances for next year as well. So, um, you know, it's, it's part of what needs to be weighed up and also even delaying mating dates so that um, there can be a little bit more recovery before the real, uh, real need for feed comes on in spring. So tell us about this funding that MPI have given out, shelling out to people like yourself, which um, is is fantastic. And, you know, I can just hear there'll be certain people watching going, oh, I know my situation better than some farm consultant. Or potentially, are we that far down the track now that we've got a respect that we can't be all things, uh, as Tangaroa was just saying on the show earlier, and we need to sit back and take the advice of the experts. Oh, look, I think New Zealand farmers are, are just brilliant, brilliant decision makers. Uh, they tend to weigh up situations uh, really well on the whole. Uh, they manage really diverse um, enterprises. So I'm not going to say that um, they can't make these decisions. Uh, but I do think that these are circumstances that are outside normal by quite a bit. And, and it's really just good business practice to have somebody else having a look uh, at, at what you're doing and, and being a uh, like a, a sounding board, if you like, uh, and, and making sure that all the options have been reasonably well considered. How's so, COVID-19 putting an effect on being able to get out on farm? Is it still business as usual with at two metres distance? No, for for us, um, we've been uh, we've been staying at home and being uh, good people, um, partly because we've had close contact uh, um, with people that have had it, so we have to stay at home. But uh, I think we would have done that anyway. So really, our, we're going to be called out as required. So we uh, we applied along with, I guess, I think there was 80,000 other businesses at that time that applied as being essential services. So uh, we uh, we joined the queue with all the rest. So, uh, I think, uh, Love a good bit of background barking. It's good. <laughs> Keeps it real. <laughs> My Labrador Huntway, I'm afraid, sorry. <laughs> no, that's good, that's good. Um, yeah. so, so so, talk us through um, the any particular tools around feed budgeting that may be new to people that they can take away and learn from um, to implement just that forecasting um, when things are looking pretty tight. Um, I don't know if they're new. I, I probably, we've been using them for ages, I guess. Uh, there's about a million spreadsheets out there that yeah. different consultants will use um, uh, to do what's essentially the same job um, and that's just matching feed supply and animal demand and I, and I think it just makes it easy to be able to 
uh, figure out how what proportion of your stock you actually need to lift in condition to get good production. Mm. Uh, and also uh, puts a number on how much feed you've got. So that you, you're just matching those two and you can be just a little bit more certain about what position your position is, especially when your position is quite different from what it normally is. When you are in a situation where there's so many different pressures going on from around the country and, you know, sort of coming at the farmer and in particular the biggest stress at the moment is around the capacity of the processes. Um, sometimes when you can step into their realm and see it from a different angle, do you see them, the farmer being able to sort of relax and, and have that support around a decision? That's the most helpful part? I think it's probably hard to relax. Uh, but I guess one of the key things is to control what you can control. You, you might not be able to control this, uh, the, meat, the space and the, and the throughput of the meat plants, but you can make a decision early to maybe use use some autumn nitrogen, uh, and if you if you have a, a reasonable workout about how much longer you might have to carry how many lambs, uh, and then even say that I want to put not enough nitrogen on to at least make up half that shortfall, I can do the rest some other way. But I need to act now to make up half that shortfall, and I think. Um, because the other way that people manage these decisions is by doing nothing and putting their head in the sand, and it, it's not really an option. Um, so so uh, if, if a decision involves uh, something like nitrogen, they need to be made uh, you know, in a very timely way. Uh, so uh, you know, I think that's, the, that's probably the key, and that's something you can control. You can't sit and worry about when the meat company is going to take your lambs. Um, it, it's not going to be positive. You, you probably need to make a, a decision that you can manage and, and, and change the feed supply demand equation some, some as if you can. There's Simon Glennie, who is a sheep and beef uh, consultant from Ab Abacus Bio, and that is off the back of that MPI have now funded farm consultants. So you can get free advice now um, just to be able to get that support that you might need with uh, the feed pinch around the country and, and making some more clear decisions uh, with that support that you'll need. So we have the poll open. Uh, the government is that we're talking about infrastructure. Chain Jones has said shovel ready infrastructure we they can push play on a lot of water storage dams have been sitting there um, ready to go do you think that water storage should be at the top of the list or is it our rural hospitals or our rural roads there is a lot of infrastructure projects that we need however we are seeing the effects in places like Hawke's Bay of not having those water storage infrastructures put in place uh, years ago so uh, we've got 90% of people saying yes online and 84% on the Facebook page now, coming up after the break, we are going to be speaking to uh, a man that I deeply respect for his experience in the agribusiness banking world. Scott Wishart from NZAB is going to join us for his tips on financial planning in this uncertain world. Uh, this man knows how to navigate banks, so you'll enjoy this, so make sure you keep watching. And if you've got any questions for Scott, put them in the comments below or, of course, on the Serious Country page on Facebook, uh, and we will be able to fire those questions to Scott because he has uh, lots and lots of knowledge in the space and uh, when there is a lot of an uncertainty here and um, how the banks are going to walk beside farmers. This is Sarah's Country. What we do day in and day out is not easy and a lot of us have felt singled out. To be honest, it's felt a bit unfair. But curiously, all the talk is a sign of something we need to take notice of. In a good way. A changing world. A world that we, the farmers, growers, fishers, makers and crafters of Aotearoa New Zealand can prosper in together. Instead of each of us trying to go it alone. Now we have a plan. A plan that within a generation will get us fit for a better world. To help us focus on the world's most discerning consumers, providing them with the outstanding, ethically produced food, drinks and natural fibres that we grow, make, catch and craft. We have a way. The Māori concept of taiao. It's all about forging a deep relationship with the natural world. 
As Kiwis, we absolutely get this, but we can do better. Putting the climate, land, water and living systems first is in our nature. Taiao will guide and connect us to regenerate, be outstanding and celebrate our New Zealandness in everything we do. We have a future, an enriched future, where we will own our part and lead the change for our country, our collective prosperity, and for our children. All of us, farmers, growers, fishers, makers and crafters, will need to get involved to encourage others to step up and win the world over like we have done many, many times before. Making this happen starts with a commitment that you and the person beside you and the person beside them can own this together. You can shape this. We can shape this. By thinking about how you can apply Taiao to what you do. It's time to work together. You change your world. Our world. Let's make it our business to shape our future. Fit for a better world. It starts now. Did you know that in the September to December quarter last year, over 600, or nearly, sorry, $600 million of debt was repaid by farmers, and those leading the pack were dairy farmers. So raise a glass of milk to that. But the world just got weird, and there's a lot of uncertainty at the moment. So how do you control the uncontrollable? That's why I decided to get a smart cookie like Scott Wishart onto Sarah's Country for you to answer all your questions when it comes to how to navigate planning for the financial year ahead. Scott Wishart is the Managing Director for NZAB and joins us now. First, Scott, how do you prepare for the worst when a worst, new worst just keeps unfolding every week? Yeah, evening, Sarah. It's an interesting one, isn't it? I think um, it just reinforces more so than ever that there's no such thing as status quo. Yeah. Um, and, and if you're planning for status quo, you're it's either going to be uh, better or worse in most cases. So, yeah, interesting times. So you're sending out a lot of advice to the not only your clients, but you're really um, passionate about getting the advice out to wider people in the industry because uh, you're, you're being very close to the ear of the banks in your previous experience. Can you just uh, update our audience on your experience and, and who is NZAB? Yeah, cool. So, I mean, look, uh, the theme tonight with, um, with Tangaroa and with Simon has, has really been about getting experts around to manage or to help you manage um, and control uh, events that are really uncertain. And I guess that's where um, our business started. So NZAB works with farmers to help them take control of their finance and their strategy and then work with their banks to make sure that they get the support uh, and the terms and conditions that they deserve. Um, it's, it's not an easy process, but it is one where um, if you take the right level of control um, and, and I suppose own your risk, um, then you can get some really good results. So as we were talking on my podcast probably a month or so ago, um, we were dealing with a, an environment where banks were trying to sort of um, heave-ho over the edge of the boat as much rural lending as they could to try and, well, not stay afloat, but um, lessen their risk. How on earth do we get banks to see that rural, rural risk is worth working with now with this change in, with COVID-19? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting point. I think the first point I'd make is that reducing risk doesn't necessarily mean reducing debt. It's about ensuring that where the debt sits is with those farmers and business owners that actually know what they've taken on and how to manage it. And so it's really, really important. And, you know, the message from uh, that previous podcast to now hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, it's about getting in front of these issues and understanding uh, how your business deals with certain shocks uh, to its performance and how, how a bank might interpret that. Um, you know, I guess the opportunity that we have right now is that um, a lot of the immediate impacts are on businesses um, outside the farm gate. Um, and and to, I suppose to, to a rugby analogy that I use a lot, um, you know, it's what you do when you don't have the ball. And I suppose for a lot of farmers, that's us now. So we have an opportunity to 
uh, get our businesses ready, understand what the next 12 or 18 months looks like, come up with a really clear plan, um, get really clear about what could affect that plan and how we might deal with it, and then get it in front of those banks now uh, before they're asking for it so that uh, they can process them through now um, you know, and, and hopefully uh, we can get on with the business of farming uh, for the next 12 or 18 months. The global financial crisis really changed things for, in particular, dairy farmers and their loan facilities, um, renewing them more regularly. And a lot of the, those will be probably coming up for renewal. Um, it's more not whether they will um, support you with any forms of extension. It's more whether they will re-sign you full stop. Uh, yeah, look, it's, um, you know, prior to GFC, most farmers probably had a 15-year loan. Um, you know, when the liquidity costs really became something that um, we all found out about, I suppose there was a tendency to shorten up um, loan expiry dates because that made the, the cost of finance a little bit cheaper. Um, I guess we see a certain set of um, circumstances right now with COVID-19 where uh, capital flowing into the banks in New Zealand could get more expensive, um, a little bit like GFC times, but hopefully not the same um, restriction on capital, although it's far too soon to tell. So I think there's a real opportunity now for farmers to be looking at any of those loan facilities that are uh, either rolling off a fixed rate or maturing over the next 12 months and look at how we can get approvals and structures in place for those now um, before those liquidity costs start to creep in because there are mechanisms to control that uh, for farmers who have the support around them to understand the options. What about cash flow forecasting going into the financial year uh, 2020 ahead and how to be able to um, stress test your business uh, to see sort of yeah. how you can put those things in place? Yeah, absolutely critical. And so I suppose, um, you know, it's easy to do a budget and, and, you know, most of us in the farming industry, you know, we are optimistic about the year ahead in most cases. Um, but I think it's about understanding what are the things that could impact our performance and what will those impacts look like when you put them on paper. And I suppose making sure that the working capital you've got or the banking facilities that you've got don't just see you through best case, but see you through worst case. Um, because there's no doubt that uh, the way banking systems and regulators look at deals these days, um, the more often you go back to the bank and ask for a change in your finance, um, you know, the, the more that does tend to count against you in, in the long run. And, you know, so I suppose it's about being prepared and understanding how to manage that. And it's different for every farmer, but the, the key thing is make sure you've got your advisors around you who understand your business, who understand yourselves as people, your family, your strategy, you know, why are you in this game? You know, because ultimately, um, you know, farmers need to be and deserve to be proud of their businesses because they're making a big difference to the world. And, um, you know, you don't you don't want to risk that by trying to solve every problem yourself. So, you know, be be proud to actually have good people around you and, and, and let them into your business. We talked on an earlier podcast too around cash flow um, when we've been so capital, uh, capital gain hungry for so long and relying on the valuation of our land as opposed to the, the black at the bottom of the balance sheet. Um, do you think that things are starting to change now, especially the way that uh, rural valuation is, is at the moment with land prices? Uh, I, I suppose we're starting to see, uh, as we get into the next valuation cycle, we're starting to see the crystallisation of some of those um, drops in values. And, and I suppose the reality is for most farmers, you know, if you if, if the bank valued your asset in the peak, you're going to have some sort of equity drop. I think for most farmers, as long as you're viable and as long as you're able to show um, that you've got control of the cash flow, I don't think that's really a problem. Uh, I, I suspect banks are going to be pretty pragmatic about it, but there will be real consequences down the track. You know, if you do need more finance in 12 or 18 months time and your balance sheet doesn't look as strong, um, you know, that is going to take some navigating. And to be honest, most of the bankers I talk to don't know how we're going to deal with this either yet. So it's mm. um, it's not an easy situation, but I guess fundamentals apply. Do you have a good business? Are you uh, sound? Uh, do you have the right people around you? And do you are you demonstrating a track record of making good decisions? And, and I suppose that's, you know, use your advisors. You know, um, I suppose it's something we spend a lot of time doing is making sure that our farmers understand how their business is performing 
and that that um, performance is always communicated to their bank and other stakeholders uh, just to demonstrate quite regularly how well they're doing. As I said, you know, making sure you show how good you are when, when you don't have the ball. Yeah, absolutely. And we were just talking earlier with Simon Glennie around this feed pinch um, and the, mm. the, the, the fear I have uh, hearing out there is this capacity at the, pro- at the processing plant um, is just going to create this uh, perfect storm with, you know, everything yep. coming in from, you know, in bovis eradication still going on and, um, and drought, et cetera. And you had suggested to me earlier that um, the banks were being extremely forthcoming in extending facility at the moment for those types of situations? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's one thing I will say for the banks is they they act exceptionally well in a crisis, um, and this is no different. So the COVID-19 impacts on uh, stock being able to go through the works, um, you know, feed, you know, obviously needing to feed those animals as they remain on farm, um, I think about the longest turnaround we've had on finance extension for those situations is about 15 minutes. So it's always exceptional um, dealing with people on the ground and banks do a really good job of empowering local bankers to make those decisions when it counts. You know, the, the key thing though is it's a bit like the dairy downturn. The same thing happened when cash flows were cut. Banks were really supportive, but but you've got to mop it up somewhere. And so I guess that's the thing you've got to be constantly thinking. You know, the crisis, we're in it now. Uh, we will come out the other side of it. We will get the support we need to make the short-term decisions, but we really need to be thinking much more further down the track than that in terms of our decision-making uh, and how to ensure that uh, when when the banks inevitably come looking for that money to come back, uh, we can demonstrate that we've already got that in hand. Uh, for those who are listening and got a burning question for Scott, please put them in the comments below. I can see um, across here, across both Farmers Weekly website under the Serious Country page and, of course, in the comments wherever you're watching, across Facebook and YouTube, um, because I'll put those to Scott. Uh, but, Scott, um, another thing you usually hear is, yeah, um, but the ba- what banks aren't listening to my, my situation and they feel frustrated um, because – They've felt like they've had a relationship with that bank intergenerational, and uh, mm. and when it comes to this point, it's not it's not the same and as rosy as you have played it out for for most people. Um, what would your advice be to those farmers to seek advice elsewhere? Um, that's not going to obviously um, some some areas that have got very high interest or high risk. Yeah, look, you have to take control of it, really. And I think that's the key thing. You know, the, the banking sector has done a really good job of controlling that for us. You know, um, the, the regulatory environment we find ourselves in now just requires, um, you know, us to, as farmers and advisors to, to to make sure that we are playing devil's advocate. We are being honest and truthful about the positions we find ourselves in, where the weaknesses are and how we're going to solve those problems, you know, rather than pretending everything's okay. Um, you know, bankers by and large, um, you know, they're all in this industry because they actually want to make a difference and they want to help farmers. You know, most most rural bankers come from farming stock themselves. They, they're just desperate for us to help them do their job. And the reality is there is just more process involved in that now. So the more we can do to control the information uh, and, and I guess understand and manage those risks, then the, the, the better it is for the banker to help with that relationship uh, and, and the better the decision is made by credit. Um, but the reality is that, that that the game has changed and and we cannot rely on the bank to to just kind of put all the information together for us and, and put that forward on, on our behalf. What about an accountant doing this for you as opposed to the services that you use? You're a, a lot more closer to what the banks want potentially than an accountant, or is that unfair? Uh, it's, it's probably unfair. We work with accountants on a daily basis. I think the, the reality is that it all play, you know we all play an important part in, in gripping up our client's position. You know, I suppose the difference we bring to the table is you know we're a business of bankers. We just don't work for the bank anymore. So we we understand the language, we understand the regulators, we understand exactly what the banks are looking for when we put information to the bank. It's in the format they want to see. It uses the language that they understand. But the reality is, it's is crap in, crap out. If if we don't have, you know, really strong accountants, farm advisors, you know, doing uh, you know adequate feed and resource budgeting, 
you know, if we don't get that accurate information as the input to our process, then we don't have a very good output from our process. So for most of our clients, we, we do start there and, and get the entire team around and work out how we can all work together uh, to achieve the farmer's goals. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us as Managing Director of NZAB, Scott Wishart. And uh, I suggest that you go and check NZAB out uh, um, because uh, not from the fact of um, any sort of paid promotion here, but for the fact, because there's not, is that uh, Scott is a very reliable source of information. I really enjoy talking to him because, as he said, there are a bunch of bankers that no longer work for the bank. And uh, how better close to the information you can get than that so this is the end of the show for the week we'll be back on monday and uh, i just wanted to end on something that got me thinking um this the the world is very quiet and eerie now the crash at jackarawa road is dead every morning which is incredible when i go on my walk and there's a v formation of birds and I sort of thought about this new world order and everyone shifting around in this formation and, and someone's going to come out good in this situation and some people are going to come out worse off. Um, but if we actually fly together in this formation, regardless of rich, poor, rural, urban, we can actually help elevate each other and thrust and lift ourselves together as a nation. We know that as farmers we are needed right now, but also we know that we need to lead from the front with our attitude towards this. So kia kaha, stay strong, and I look forward to interacting with you again on Monday with a fresh new week of Sarah's Country. This is Sarah's Country.